Every day, the US and China are marching closer to war. And while the images of Ukraine and Gaza are fresh in our minds, the upcoming war between the US and China will be nothing like you expect. It will not be a ground invasion, an amphibious battle, nor will it go nuclear, because the future battle between the US and China is already underway, and it's going to be a war fought with artificial intelligence. Whoever wins this war for technological supremacy can become the world's most dominant superpower. But can the US and China find a way to cooperate and actually avoid a future conflict? The US is trying to win this war by cutting China off from cutting edge AI microchips. But I recently sat down with Alvin Wong Graylin, one of the world's leading experts on AI, and learned this about the U.S. containment strategy against China. In terms of the geopolitical side, I, I think that's something that has been a major conflict between the countries because the U.S. is right now clearly the, the global leader in the AI research side right? and have been wanting to maintain their position. right? Uh, and in fact, by doing it almost by force, because they're now restricting exports of the latest processors and other technologies to China to, in an effort to slow down their development. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that may actually come back and backfire on, on the U.S. because it feels like because of that type of activity, you know, China is now investing an order of magnitude more effort right. to try to either catch up or at least not fall behind too far. Right. And making sure that their semiconductor technology, the production technology and the design technologies is, is coming up to speed. I met with Alvin during this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. It's the world's largest tech show and incredibly, over 30% of the companies on display come directly from mainland China. This just shows us how vital China is to the actual U.S. economy. But there's a large disconnect from what our U.S. politicians preach every day and what is happening in the real world. U.S. politicians believe the best strategy is to insulate America from China over national security concerns. Essentially, the U.S. fears that almost everything from China, but most especially advanced tech and top talent, has shadowy ties to the Chinese government. The U.S. fears this Chinese tech could be used to spy on and sabotage America as well as its NATO allies. But once again, Alvin proves why it's absolutely vital for the U.S. and China to find a way to work together. I think in terms of the, the geopolitical issue, one of the key things that we need to focus on is that not one country wins, that we all work together because the only way for us to get to AGI before a single road state gets it or a terrorist group gets it is, is if every country works together right. and builds that AGI. Right. And build it in a way where we're sharing the resources. Because if we get to AGI, that AGI brings the, the world abundance. Right. And worse is what's going to happen is if any one country gets it or one company or one person gets it, they will be tempted to misuse that to gain power. Right. And if that happens, we all lose. So if one company, one country, or one person wins, we all lose. Yeah. If we all win together, we all build it together, then we all win. I think that that's really something that we need to keep that in mind. Alvin is an absolute genius when it comes to the future of AI and the metaverse. And his message here is so important. No one country, company, or person should master AI. But instead, it should be a resource that we learn to collaborate on and reap the benefits together for a brighter and more prosperous world. Stay tuned to the end of today's video as I'm going to share with you my entire interview with Alvin as he will explain everything you need to know about artificial intelligence and its future in our world. But first, let me explain why the U.S. containment strategy against China has a major problem. When it comes to AI, China already has a decisive lead in some crucial areas. In particular, China now has the world's biggest pool of critical data and talent that analyzes it, along with state-of-the-art practice. If computation is the engine of the AI revolution, then data is its fuel. The brutal and simple truth here is that the US actually cannot afford to contain or isolate itself from China. By rejecting collaboration, the US is stifling its own industries and scientific research, especially in key AI-related fields that China now leads, such as industrial automation, medical research, and autonomous transportation. Sound far-fetched? Consider that China by now has installed around half of the world's industrial robots and has an operational stock of almost 2 million robots. The latest data shows that in 2022, China alone accounted for more than half of new installations in the world, prompting the president of the International Federation of Robotics, Marina Bill, to say China is by far the world's largest market for robotics. But this is just the beginning. 
Just listen to what David P. Goldman, the deputy editor of Asian Times and a Washington fellow of the Claremont Institute revealed last month. China may not produce the fastest computer chips, but it has far more experience in some critical applications of AI. With 70% of the world's installed 5G capacity, China is far ahead of the US in AI-guided transportation with fully automated ports that can unload a container ship in an hour rather than the day it takes at America's biggest port of Long Beach. Huawei claims to have 10,000 customers for private 5G networks that control industrial robots, monitor machines for preventative maintenance, perform quality control on conveyor belts, and in some cases, program themselves for industrial processes. I know of only three US manufacturers with dedicated 5G networks, Ford, GM, and John Deere. This sobering reality for the US doesn't just apply to AI and its related key sectors. Take something as fundamental as trade, for example. Our US politicians are currently hell-bent on decoupling from China economically and pressuring other nations to stop working with China and instead join the US in its mission to contain and isolate China from the rest of the world. However, this is not only futile, but self-defeating for the US and there's no clearer confirmation of this than the recent explanation given by the former president of the UN Security Council, Kishore Mabubani. The US containment of the Soviet Union succeeded because back then, more countries traded with the US than the Soviet Union. However, the US containment of China will fail because it's the opposite situation. China has already integrated itself with the world more than the US has, and more countries do trade with China than they do with the US. Because of that, if the US tries to contain China instead of the US isolating China, the US will find itself isolated from the rest of the world. This perfectly illustrates how drastically the power dynamic in our world has changed. Not only that, but by now, the US and Chinese economies are practically joined at the hip and depend on each other tremendously. The simple truth is that the US must learn to coexist and cooperate with China. Now, the US still has some notable advantages over China when it comes to AI. It leads China in so-called foundation models by two to three years, which are what generative AI, such as ChatGBT, are based on. The US also still produces the most cutting edge AI chips in the world World, which it has recently banned China from acquiring. However, this lead may be short-lived, as China now leads the world in AI research and papers published. For example, a comprehensive report by McKinsey revealed that already in 2021, China produced one-third of both AI journal papers and AI citations worldwide, and accounted for around one-fifth of global private investment funding attracting more than $17 billion for AI startups. What's more, this Economist article entitled Just How Good Can China Get at Generative AI reveals that nine of the world's top 10 institutions by volume of AI publications are now Chinese. Shockingly, this lead in industry now extends to the university level as well. Mr. Goldman reveals some stunning statistics. China now graduates more engineers and computer scientists than the rest of the world combined. The US awarded 127,000 bachelor degrees in engineering and 105,000 in computer science in 2021. That's just one-sixth of China's 1.4 million engineering graduates that year. Only 6% of American undergrads major in engineering because grade schools don't produce enough qualified candidates, and Chinese universities are close to par with the U.S. in quality, having all but caught up in the last 10 years. This is according to the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, a think tank at Georgetown University, which produced a comprehensive comparison between U.S. and Chinese top universities. This dire situation for the U.S. is perfectly summarized by Edward Doherty, a distinguished professor of engineering at Texas A&M University. Professor Doherty perfectly illustrates the plight of many scientists in the U.S. who cannot obtain the data they need domestically, either due to privacy laws and other legal barriers, or simply because there is no data. When the data doesn't exist or cannot be obtained, our scientists may face a choice, abandon a promising line of research, or collaborate with a laboratory in China that has the needed data. If the U.S. government limits these kinds of collaborative relationships without changing laws to make it possible to obtain the necessary data, the U.S. is the loser. China has excellent scientists and the data. The U.S. will have excellent scientists, but without the data. Indeed, if the U.S. government decides to limit cooperation with China, there is the possibility that the number of first-rate Chinese scientists already returning to China would increase, thereby decreasing U.S. expertise. Clearly, if Western nations don't have their own data needed to advance their research, it's in their best interest to acquire it from the nation that has the world's biggest pool of critical data. But let's be clear here. No one is suggesting to simply open the floodgates and exchange all data and talent between the U.S. and China. 
without any consideration to national security. Once again, Mr. Goldman explains it best. China already has decisive advantages in critical data and their applications to AI, making it harder for American researchers to eschew collaboration with China and key fields like medical research and industrial automation. It's simply hard to conduct AI research without Chinese researchers. Therefore, we need to strike a balance between safeguarding national security and cutting off access to indispensable data, talent, and state-of-the-art practice. There's a fine line between protecting American secrets and stifling research by excluding the world's biggest pool of data and the talent that analyzes it. This is something American business leaders have always deeply understood, that maintaining strong economic ties and collaboration with China is absolutely vital to the health and future of the U.S. economy as well as its businesses. The simple truth is that our economies are so intertwined that we cannot decouple from China without also killing our own economy. Unfortunately, this simple fact is something that Western politicians can't seem to wrap their head around. Instead, they continue to call for fully decoupling from China and to insulate us from all Chinese technology technology and talent. Perhaps nowhere is this better demonstrated than in the microchip industry. The US government has banned all companies, including even foreign ones, from selling their cutting edge AI chips to China. But in a new report from Nikkei Asia, this week, it was revealed that Japan had significant growth of 27.5% in the export of chip manufacturing equipment to China, showing that despite calls from the US government to cut off China, the Chinese market is simply just too important of a market for chip manufacturers. The same can be said for noteworthy US chip makers, including Nvidia, Intel, and Qualcomm. The reason is simple. China is their biggest customer, and cutting them off has led to billions of dollars in lost revenue, including massive cuts to R&D. U.S. chipmakers have criticized these restrictions and lobbied hard to change them, warning that cutting China from cutting-edge chips will simply drive Chinese firms to innovate and develop their own, instead of being able to just rely on Western technology. And this is precisely what has come to pass, as China is now achieving the very breakthroughs the U.S. asserted would be impossible, and ultimately has emerged more resilient, innovative, and self-reliant. I think I've made my point quite clearly that the US and China need to collaborate and learn to coexist, not only geopolitically, but also in the most important industry that will literally change the future of our world. And that, of course, is artificial intelligence. But if you're still not convinced about the role of AI in the metaverse and the future of our world, then I'm excited to show you my full interview with Alvin Wong Grayland. In this interview, we discuss so many important things, including the metaverse, the future of data security and privacy, and how AI will have a major impact on the future relationship between the US and China. This is an incredible chat. Let's jump in. Well, everybody, I'm very honored to be joined by Alvin Wong Graylin. <laughs> Alvin, so nice to see you. Yeah, great to see you again. It's always nice to go face to face. Absolutely. So Alvin and I know each other back from, our, from my days in Shanghai. And uh, it's really awesome because Alvin is one of the world's leading experts on the AI and the metaverse. Really excited for today's talk because I think this is really what is changing our world. He is also a recently published author, Our Next Reality. So Alvin, I'm really excited to learn about this and I know a lot of the fans of the channel are as well. Sure. So I just wanna know, I'm not an expert on this. That's what I'm asking you, but you know, let's talk about metaverse. Is this really going to happen? <laughs> Well, I think that's been a question for the last uh, year and a half after the big hype that came up, you know, about two, three years ago. Right. I, I think there's kind of a confusion in terms of what is the metaverse, right? First, we just have to quickly define it, and that way we don't get it uh, conflated with a lot of different things. Because people related to crypto said it was the metaverse, and then there was all these games that said they were metaverse. But the, the, the reality is that the, the metaverse, what it should be, is the internet that we have today. But right. instead of a 2D internet, we go to a 3D internet. Okay. So I think it's, it's actually a very simple thing. Right. It is actually not just going to happen. It is an inevitability that right? it, it is going to happen. Because right. as technology keeps progressing, we will continue to have more higher fidelity experiences. So, you know, two days ago, I was, I was here at the Sphere at, at Las Vegas. And essentially what that is, is a 3D movie and viewing experience. Right. Right. And I was thinking everybody that was there was like, wow, this is so amazing. And I'm like, you know what? This is actually kind of a very basic VR experience. Right. And I can only look forward at 180 degrees. Whereas in, right. a, in a real VR experience, I can walk around. Right. I can look behind me. You know, right. when I was on those seats and I look behind me, it's just other seats. Right. 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 So, so something that costs $2 billion to make, you can have that same experience at home right. with a modern headset today. Essentially, any modern headset will be able to do a more comprehensive visual experience. I think the one one thing that that $2 billion facility gave you was the ability to do it together with your friends without putting on a headset. So you have a more of a social experience. Right. So very soon, we're going to have that type of experience 
but not just for watching movies, but for actually experiencing virtual worlds. Right, right. right so we're going to go from websites to virtual worlds as our primary destination for commerce, for browsing, right. for education, right. and even for work. Yeah. So I think that that's really something that we don't have to really question whether it will happen. It is a matter of time. Devices are getting smaller. And behind me, we're at the CES, XR, VR, Metaverse area. And, you know, all kind of companies around the world are here that are showing what devices are going to look like. And they're getting thinner. They're getting lighter. They're more comfortable. They're more in high resolution. This week, they also announced, uh, Apple announced that they're going to launch the their Vision Pro in the beginning of February. Okay. Uh, I think that's right. actually going to make a major contribution to the industry. Because what that's going to do is to have a, you know, the, the largest, you know, both valuable company in the world is going to spend billions of dollars right. educating the entire world about why a 3D experience is important. Right. And okay. they're going to have millions of people lining up at their stores around the world trying on this you know, very high fidelity device. Right. And it's going to change the minds of all of those people who, who thought, oh, you know, that VR metaverse thing, it's just some box on your head and it's, you know, it, it made me sick, all of that. And right, right. it's not going to happen because yeah, now yeah. you have essentially the highest quality visual experience possible, even more than your 4K TV at home. Exactly. In fact, it's 4K per eye. Yeah, yeah. So amazing. All of these people are going to say, wow, this is great, but I can't afford a $4,000 product. Right. And then the, all these people will say, well, you know, there's other things that are maybe, a, you know, one-fifth the price, but... Uh, you know, and 90% of the quality. Why don't I go get that? Right, right. right. So I think it's going to help really push the entire industry forward. Okay. Yeah. And then right. here, one of the big stories this week was AI, right? If you yeah. go every single uh, call, right. everybody said, I'm smart this or AI that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. AI, one thing is, is you know, to, to uh, you know, here's like, you know, smart TVs and smart toilets and all these things. But the, the other thing that people have been talking about is generative AI and okay. using AI to create content. Right. So the biggest issue in the past has been, you know, not enough content for these XR devices. Right. But very soon we're going to have uh, the ability to have somebody use a prompt not to make a picture or a video, but to make 3D worlds. Nice, nice. When they do that, what it does is, it, you know, it takes the cost of making a world in the past was tens of thousands or millions of dollars to make a, a virtual game, a 3D game. Now we can bring it down to thousands of dollars or maybe less than that to make a high quality game using AI as your production studio. Right. So that that's going to change the game. Okay. So it's going to make uh, the metaverse something that everybody wants to go see. Wow, amazing. Very good prediction. Now, let's kind of shift the focus to AI because I know that's your other area of expertise. And what is the role of AI in our in the future of our world? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've been studying both AI and XR for 30 years. So yeah. this, I, it's really amazing to see progress has happened yeah. in these three decades. Oh, yeah. And it's also really great to see them converging right now. Okay. They're both maturing to a stage where they will essentially become a mass market product at around the same time. Yeah. And that changes our relationship with technology, with computing, and in fact, with each other. Right. Right. Because... Once you have uh, AI around us, right now people are talking about generative AI. It's really just about creating something. Right. But very soon we're going to get to pervasive AI, where AI is everywhere around us, and it just becomes like a utility. Okay. Uh, and then the next stage after that, essentially, is artificial general intelligence. Okay. Or artificial super intelligence, which is kind of the optimal level of general intelligence. Gotcha. And when that happens, essentially, we will have the ability to solve all of the the biggest issues that we've had in the world, whether it's climate or it's equality or it's hunger or cancer. Yeah. It will be intelligent enough to solve all of these problems that that we have been, you know, spending countless decades or, or centuries on, right? And it will solve them. And it yeah, will yeah. make us going from a scarcity focused society yeah. into a abundance focused society. Nice. Right. And yeah. that, that's gonna change the economy as well. Right, right. That's definitely some positives uh, with AI. And it yeah. certainly definitely presents us with a much brighter future when you talk about going from a scarcity uh, situation to an abundance. but. Three words, privacy, identity, security. I think that's, I think a lot of people have that because I know, if, like, for example, I think the United States and China, both very big on the future of AI, both contributing a lot to AI. Yeah. What about the privacy factor? I think that's an important thing that many people are probably worrying about. Yeah. So I actually spent uh, three, four years in the cybersecurity industry in my past life, and I am very conscious of these issues. In fact, uh, that part of the book is uh, one whole section is about identity, security, transparency, right. and, and how do you maintain your agency? Right. This is where it's important for the government to actually step in and, and help protect the 
the individual or the okay. population. Because these technologies, like all technologies, are double-edged swords. Yeah. And they can be used for good or bad. Right. And there are always bad actors, right? People who want to do things for their own good, but not necessarily the good of society. Right. And they will use these tools in those ways. Right. So it's up to us uh, or it's up to regulators to make sure that there are rules out there to find them and, and protect against that. The other thing we need to do is to also educate the public more because right now there's so much fake content out there. You won't know which is which, even right. for an expert. Right. Uh, and especially during like an election year like we have right now, right. Uh, it, it can swing the the, the, the votes in a, in a very different way, right? which could have dire consequences. Correct. Right. So it is something that the, the regulations need to go and make sure the platforms that are using it are very transparent in terms yes. of saying, is this a AI generated content? Is it an artificial content or is this a natural content? Uh, yeah. Let that be visible. Yeah. If it's an advertising, it should let me know, you know, the avatar I'm talking to, is that really Cyrus? Right. Or is it uh, Cyrus AI that's being bought by an advertiser to, right. to start to sell me something? Right, right. Because if you're talking to me and I'm like, oh, Cyrus says that, then it's probably good. I'm going to trust him. Right. But right now you can't really tell. Right. So you, we need to make sure that there's regulation that it has a little, you know, flashing light that says I'm an ad. You know, kind of like right. if you go on, on, on uh, websites today and it's a sponsored ad, it would tell you it's that's right ad. that's right yeah but in in virtual reality it may not be as clear right, right. the other thing is uh, the you know privacy privacy i think we have to admit something is that there probably is very little privacy already pretty much everybody who has a phone every moment of your day is being recorded in some way whether by your location by your actions by sound because you know whenever you say siri or alexa or whatever right you know it's announced as it hears you right that information is going somewhere right right and so um I think there's a bit of an illusion of, uh, of privacy. Okay. And when we talk about it, I know a lot of people are very sensitive about it. But then the funny thing is when you then say, oh, you know, I'll give you this candy bar if you give me your phone number. Right. Pretty much everybody give your phone number. Right. In fact, if there's, there's been tests where not only are you phone numbers, they're giving away their social security number. Jeez. And for, for a candy bar or for a little little trinket at a, at a club or something. Right. 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 So people's behaviors uh, don't really match what they say. Right. And younger generation are also less privacy sensitive right. than the older generation. Right. So it's something that we really need to kind of figure out how, how much privacy is, is really available. And, right. uh, and then how uh, the, the platform providers and governments should be part of protecting that. So I, I don't have a real answer for you on, yeah. on, on that, uh, the privacy issue. But the, the security issue I do have a comment on is that I, I think we need to do something with AI that we've been doing with viruses and hackers for a long time, which is actually have proactive cybersecurity. Right. right. No, so having detection and then having the ability to, to mitigate the harm of, of those things that it detects. Right. Right. right now, when I see a virus come to my computer, it would say, oh, I've detected there's this virus. Do you want me to get rid of it? Right, right. But right now, if, if on my social media, there's a fake feed that's trying to influence me to buy something or to, to do something negative, right. there's nothing that protects me. Right. So we need to create software or the industry needs to invest in, in solutions akin to what we've been doing in the cybersecurity space for hackers and denial service attacks and all these other things. Right, right. So that industry hasn't focused on it and it needs to be part of that priority. Okay, that's a good answer, but one of the things I've heard you say was it really comes down to government, right? Government needs to get involved here. And I'm just thinking about this a little one step further here. We've got United States and China, big contributors to AI. To, governments need to get involved. What are the geopolitical you know, uh, impacts here, you know, as far as AI and metaverse and that. Oh, so we'll talk about geopolitics. Yeah. So the good thing is actually the governments are already getting bought. Actually, China was one of the first countries in the world to issue privacy protection, protection in terms of ability to turn off agent-based suggestions, right, in your deeds. They're, they also just came out with an engine-based solution where uh, or a regulation that actually tells is that the responsibility of the provider of the AI, if something bad goes wrong. Right. So they will need to make sure that they actually police their own system. Right. Now, and if there's a problem, they need to notify people and they have a certain amount of time to fix it. So, right. so there, there, there's at least some level of responsibility and they also need to you know, provide the provenance of the content that they trained on. Right. And that way, you know, if, if, if there's copyright issues, if, if people are, are, are infringing the things, uh, you know where, where, you know, where it came from and who should be benefited from it. Yeah. So, so I think that's something that the, the West actually learned from China on. The EU recently had an AI act that's been enacted. The, the U.S. has some uh, White House policies that they put out, kind of a white paper suggestion. So, so they're, they're coming out. Uh, and I think that in, uh, in the, within the next year, uh, all the major regions will have regulation that tries to protect the public in some way. Nice. I, I don't think it protects them from the future threat of, let's say, an AGI misuse. Right. But it will protect them from 
uh, some of the, 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 the misuse of uh, probably Gen AI quality uh, AI. In terms of the geopolitical side, I, I think that's something that has been a major conflict between the countries because the U.S. is right now clearly the, the global leader in the AI research side. Right. And have been wanting to maintain their position. Right. Uh, and in fact, by doing it almost by force, because they're now restricting exports of the latest processors and other technologies to China to in an effort to slow down their development. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that may actually come back and backfire on, on the U.S. because it feels like because of that type of activity, you know, China is now investing an order of magnitude more effort right. to try to either catch up or at least not fall behind too far. Right. And making sure that their semiconductor technology, the production technology and the design technologies is, is coming up to speed. I think in terms of the, the geopolitical issue, one of the key things that we need to focus on is that not one country wins, that we all work together because the only way for us to get to AGI before a single road state gets it or a terrorist group gets it is, is if every country works together right. and builds that AGI right. and build it in a way where we're sharing the resources. Because if we get to AGI, that AGI brings the, the world abundance. Right. And versus what's going to happen is if any one country gets it or one company or one person gets it, they will be tempted to misuse that to gain power. Right. And if that happens, we all lose. So if one company, one country or one person wins, we all lose. Yeah. If we all win together, we all build it together, then we all win. I think that that's really something that we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's a, that's really important. Well, but I think it's really awesome because I think, you know, so much of um, when we talk about metaverse and AI, you know, we're thinking, you know, these futuristic headsets, maybe maybe something fun or enjoyable. But actually, like you said, I think um, as someone that deals in geopolitics, you know, there's a lot more consequences, you know, and it could fall into the wrong hands. So it's all the all the more important for us to work together. And I think that's, that's really a key message that I try to preach on the YouTube channel is always U.S., China working together. You know, when that happens, the world wins. And exactly. I think you've given us a really great point, you know, certainly when we're talking about metaverse and definitely AI, which, as you said, we're here at the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Almost every booth, AI, AI, I mean, it's yeah. definitely moving the industry forward. So. Um, last thing, I know that you recently published a book, yeah. uh, Our Next Reality. Yes. Right. So, uh, our, so we're going to plug that. Our Next Reality. So the thing, this launches on March 5th. And if you're interested in learning again more about the metaverse and AI and the kind of the future of our world, this really is going to be Our Next Reality. I want you to check out Alvin's book. We're yeah. going to drop and, a link down. Go to the website, ournextreality.com. In fact, on the, on the website in the bottom, there's a... Uh, I made a special GPT based on the book. So I fed the book into a GPT. Okay. And it, it can answer any questions about these areas uh, based on the content there. So okay. it's a way for you to get a little preview of what's, what it says before it comes out. That's awesome. Alvin, thank you so much for the education. You know, I, I like to invite people on the show that are much smarter than me so that I can learn, but all of us can learn together. And I've learned a lot about the metaverse and AI. So thank you so much. Hey, th thanks, I You're the best, man. <laughs> I appreciate it, bud. All right. Everybody, make sure that you watch. Uh, click down in the description below. Check out um, Alvin's website for the new book that's launching on March 5th. And if you have any questions about AR Metaverse, drop them down in the comments. We'll look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon. Hey, thank you.